Okie doke. Yes, we have new material. We're in a new land. All right, so today, uh, so for y'all who are joining, this class is called the Science and Development of Halakha. And um, that's what we're doing. Today, I wanted to tackle this, this idea. It's a, cool, it's a cool question. What did Moshe know, and when did he know it? Hmm, it's, a, it's an important question. So, kind of drawing this guy back to Shmos, we have a, we have a cool pasuk. Yeah, this is when Hashem calls Moshe Benu up to Har Sinai, and Hashem says to Moshe, come on up to the mountain, stay there. I'm going to give you, and he makes a list, the Luchos Avanim, the Torah, the Mitzvah, singular, kind of funny there, Asher Ketafti, that which I wrote, so we'll figure that one out, Lahora Sam, in order to paskin halacha. So, Gemara Brachos, Memcha Samad Aleph, Rebbe Levi spells out, well, what are these specific objects? Why are the repetitiveness? Obviously, these are different things. So, the Luchos themselves are the actual Luchos. You know, they've got the Ten Commandments written in stone by the finger of God. That's cool. Torah is five books of Moses, no surprises there. The mitzvah is Mishnah, with the, the idea being, you know, taking the narrative stories, because the Chumash is narrative stories, and unpacking, extracting the meaning out of those narrative stories, that is what the Mishnah is. Asher Ketafti, that is referencing this sort of, this is a, a, a the katafti, that which I wrote, there's a, there is a, an intimate relationship implied there, as I wrote, I God. So that's describing Navi. Lahora Sam, well, these are all the elements that are missing from the written text that actually enable being able to use the thing. You know, such as, you know, when in, in the actual five books of Moses, God describes to Moshe, you know, you have, to, you have to slaughter animals in the way I showed you. Well, nowhere in the text are we given any sort of indication how you slaughter animals. The, the, the Gemara is those missing pieces, and it also is the analysis of Mishnah. That's what Hashem, that is what Moshe Rabbeinu, based on this position, received at Har Sinai. Okay. We're not going to get to it this week, but there by hangs a tail. It is not a clear, uh, uh, it's not clear that that is actually the case. It's not clear that Moshe got everything on Har Sinai. So we're going to spell out what those positions are. But today, <laughs> how you doing? Today what I'd like to do is hit these first four um, things, what are they? What's their significance? Because, I mean, it's kind of a fair, we can really draw this out even more. I mean, it's really just kind of fair. Well, why don't we just, like, chuck everything and keep the Shulchan Aruch? I mean, that's all of halacha, and if, well, if that's the point, well, why not? You know, it's effective, it's efficient. So, Eric, yeah. The last one that you mentioned, it's not. Well, it's I'm cheating a little bit. I didn't I didn't list it. It's it was written a couple hundred years ago by uh, Rav Yosef Karo, mm -hmm. and it's basically the rule book, taking all of halacha, and he decided on every case in halacha that's applicable in today's life. He just made a rule book. So, but the point I'm making is, well, why do we have to have these different versions of the same material? What do we gain from that? So the best way to do it is outline, well, what are these things? And then we'll have some sense of that. Okay. So are we going to answer the questions of what did Moshe know when? Yeah. And, and yeah, and how did he, did he get everything out? Next week, or maybe the week after, depending upon what sort of mood I'm in. But yes, we're going to answer that. <laughs> yeah, okay. well, we've only got next week and the week after. Oh, no, and then what? Then what happens? We're done. Finished. Then you're finished? Then you're done? Yeah. You're not going to come back after we're that? From town, you are shaking Okay, good to know. Did they not tell the teachers that? I, I didn't realize it was three weeks. I, was, I knew it was coming up, but I was a little fuzzy on that, so that's good to know. Don't worry, us too. So I better answer the question, huh? <laughs> well, we're going to tell you when we were ending. Okie doke. 
So, so fine. So what, what are the luchos of anim? What exactly are these things? What are the Ten Commandments? So you're kind of running through them all. I mean, if you haven't read them, it's a good time to, to know them now. You know, the first commandment is, well, there's a God. Number two is you shouldn't have any other gods except for that God. You shouldn't take God's name in vain is number three. Don't take false oaths using God's name. Uh, you got to remember Shabbos. That's number four. Number five is you got to honor your father and mother. Number six is don't murder. Number seven is don't is 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 don't uh, don't don't uh, illicit relations. Don't do that sort of stuff. Don't steal is number eight. Don't don't lie when you give testimony. And don't uh, don't uh, the nice English word. Don't covet the the objects of your friend. I mean, you don't try and swindle other people out of their stuff by manipulating them. That's that's basically what that means. You know, something like I'll get, you know you know a, a person's prized uh, you know wedding album. Let's say you're just a weird obsessive and you want their their wedding album. And well, you know, I want to give that to me for one thousand dollars. I know you do. You get a little intimidated. You get weird on them. You know, maybe about two thousand dollars. Well, that's a lot of money. Fair enough. I mean, it's like, well, maybe you, maybe it'll go up to five thousand. Usually, the husband will sell it for that, and the wife will get angry. She she levels out at eight. But like, you know, well, but that's us, sir. That's that's coveting another person's object, manipulating them against their will to try and get them willingly, unwillingly, to give them their stuff to you. So, like, let's say you wanted to buy a house from someone, and they're like, yeah. "We're not selling, we're not selling," and you yeah. keep raising the price. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's like the mafia. No, you, I'm, you're you're selling, and you haven't, you, you want to sell. Yeah, okay. you want to sell. Don't Can you worry. pretend to someone that the food's not really so good because you want to eat more of it? That would save yeah, that, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> save it for me. Yeah, that would be another example. Yeah, I mean, if you all, you know, went in on it, where everyone paid the same amount, you know, yeah, exactly. Would it, right. it, okay, would it be coveting if it was like, oh, like, look, can I sell, can I buy your house? No, I'm not selling. And then you come back with more offers. You don't say yeah. like you want to sell. You just keep bringing more offers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to get the point. Yeah, they don't want to sell. Okay, so those two commandments. Good to have those in mind. So what? So what makes them so special? Uh, I really like atheists. I think that they're really interesting people. They're usually highly intelligent, and so whenever you have a, whenever you hear an atheist have a difficulty, write it down and create a solution because then you'll enrich your lives by a lot. So one atheist I really like is Christopher Hitchens. You ever hear of him? He passed away recently. Cancer it was really sad. He was also Jewish. He was secular, but he was also Jewish. Anyway, so he he I loved his line. He had this piece that he would he would recycle in all of his debates. Where he would say some of the effect of, you know, and, you know, that he just, you know, very condescending. He, he was British, so he had, like, the accent from an American standpoint. He had the accent where it really hit home. But, you know, this idea of, well, you know, I really hope, you know, he kind of builds this picture up of the Jewish people coming to Har Sinai and they're ready to receive the Ten Commandments. And, and then they get all this stuff. He's like, he says, you know, well, you know, I really hope they weren't standing there with their mouths agape, shocked. You shouldn't kill anybody. You had to go to Har Sinai to learn don't murder people. Okay, maybe the last one we got a little fancy, you know, like don't don't be like the mafia and and and, and push people into selling stuff. That's that's maybe the most uh, interesting one on the list. But everything else is common sense. So that 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 is the um, the uh, the basic challenge to religion that any atheist will give you is well, you're you're the way they set the story up something like this that you're given a whole bunch of rules and regulations that most of them are common sense and they make sense, so good on your religion. It's at that stage they're making a straw man because what they're doing is rules and regulations, they make it sound parochial. They're pulling out the wisdom of the religion and making it sound like it's a rule book, which it's not. So fair enough, you may have common sense. And so, you know, well, common sense is common sense. Well, why do you need religion then? You know, because they have a whole bunch, not so many silly laws that don't make any sense. And then you have the fanatics who cause problems. So the atheists argue. Are you still quoting him? Yeah, this is his kasha. This is his difficulty. So you might as well just, you know, live with common sense. That's a good rule. Rationality is great. You know, 500 years ago, we discovered the scientific method, so we don't need religion anymore. And it's filled with fanatics anyway. That's the kasha that he presents. That's his difficulty against religion. But what, what to him makes it rational? Well, I mean, these things, I hope, are common sense. Don't yeah, kill people. Yeah, but something has to make it rational. That's true. That's true. 
Um, yeah, in the olden days, they used to kill very, I mean, like, very fast times. That's true. They were, like, think, thinking yeah. times of Sudan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not for now, but, I mean, if I, if I wanted, I could... No, because you were saying... I could make a Kantian Jesus argument that's completely Kant. divorced of religion. That's whatever... I mean, the way, that, the way that Kant puts it is, you know, morality is, based on generating from reason, is creating axioms that if you were to contradict them, you would be bothered by it. So, like, lying. Don't lie. It's a, it's a rule. So, don't lie would be an axiom because, well, as soon as you say, well, it's okay to lie, well, you would be happy to live in a world where lying's okay, right? So, based on reason alone, um, using Kant's nice little Shazam trick here, um, we obviously, it immediately becomes obvious that we don't want to live in a world where people lie because we wouldn't want to be lied to. So you can, you can, you can, it's called the categorical comparative, look it up, interesting ideas, but that's for another time. Getting into, getting into that. Um, but it's okay, so fair enough. I, I wanted to bring Rafsad Yagon. And I think that he has the best response to Hitchens. Rafsad Yagon, he was one of the Gaonim, which means he basically, what makes a Gaon, they were the guys that lived right after the Gemara, right after all of Jewish law and Jewish theology was concretized, written, and sealed. The Gaonim were the guys who received that. They had all the books, all the libraries, you know, all the, all the things that we don't have today. They had direct access. So whenever you see something written from a Gaon, you better listen because they're taking all of knowledge of Judaism and they're 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 giving it to you with a perfect package. So he says in his book Munos Videos, he writes that that he, that he says something to the effect that I refuse I would refuse to talk to anybody who would tell me they need a divine decree to know that murdering and stealing is wrong. I would not talk to such people. The Yes. So he's sharing the first part of our buddy Hitchens. I sure hope you don't need God to tell you not to hurt people. It's fundamental. And we talked in previous classes the idea of, of human rationality as, as, as being so potent because we're made in, in the image of God that when we realize something is reasonable, it, we are just as obligated in that as if it was written out in a legal Jewish text. Human reason is powerful because we are powerful as creatures and created in the image of God. So it's, 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 it's in line with this idea. What, what, what Rafsad Yagon goes on to describe is that the Ten Commandments, it's not that we're so interested. Thou shalt not kill. You better know that already. What's really important to know when it comes to Ten Commandments, is that there is a hierarchy of moral values. Rules and looking at rules standing in of themselves is really simplistic. It's the interplay. When you have to balance multiple rules at the same time to figure out what's the proper path of life, that is the novelty of the Ten Commandments. And as I listed them, as I went listing them down, I mean, the primary value is believing there's, there, there is a God, which is basically synonymous with, well, there is a transcendent objective truth to the world. Wait, well, so what's the novelty, novelty of the Ten Commandments? That it's a hierarchy of values. There's, it's not that there's individual rules, but you have to learn how to balance them all together. So yeah, make a list of priorities. So these ten are the hierarchy of everything else. So that within these ten, yes, there's a hierarchy. and that the, within within these ten, all halachas fit into one of these ten categories. So they're almost like chapters to a book. But the the main purpose of the ten commandments is is something much deeper that our buddy Hitchens missed. It's not that. Oh, you know, we just, you know, religious people have their brains falling out of their ears and we need to know, don't kill people. This is way more sophisticated than that. This is, you have to create a science of morality. It's a demand to do that. It's not enough just to know there's a bunch of rules and you have to follow, but you have to learn how to make them all work together as you go through life. And that's the message of the Ten Commandments. And that... They are, they are strong as stone. 
They're immutable. That's the symbolism why they're written in stone. You, you have to contend with making values live together. It's immovable, just like stone, this challenge of life. That's putting back the wisdom that he was taking out in his straw man. The other, the other interesting, um, I guess, idea that we, that we take out of the Ten Commandments, again, this sort of idea that they're immutable, they happen to be, since these are the, the, the basis of all of Judaism, we have this concept called a harasha, that some, yeah, meaning, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a um, emergency uh, moral uh, value to take on that actually the Torah forbids. So an example of that is, you know, the story of Eliyahu on Har Carmel, you know, where he gets up there and he's, and he's offering, he creates a, he creates a bama, he creates a, 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 a what's the English term? Oh, man, the a Altar, thank you. So he created, well, that's forbidden because you can't have an altar outside of the temple. So, so in that moment, because so much was riding on proving to all the, the idol worshippers of the time that God is real, so he, that's a Horah Shah, he broke the Torah in order to preserve it. And then that story is that God accepted his Corbin and a divine fire fell from the sky, had his Corbin, everybody was convinced, and he changed he changed, Jewish, he changed Jewish society and saved it by breaking it. Again, this very much strikes the heart of creating hierarchies of value. Wait, it's so a, he was okay with doing that? Yeah, but, but what the Ten Commandments says is, okay, sometimes you have to break the rules, but buddy, these ten you can never break. So it's, it's, there's, a, there's a weight to them when it comes to this idea of harasha. Well, we're going to get to a little later, This again, this idea of Harash Shah. It never yeah. be broken because we do have instances when it does get broken. So there's another example of that is the writing down of the Torah Shabal Peh, the Oral Torah, in the form of the Gemara. That is forbidden. Medder Raisa. No, I'm saying these ten can be broken. Those, well, you shouldn't. No, meaning you can't break them. No Navi could ever say, oh, exception, you know, to prove God's existence, I'll murder somebody. No, that you there, can't there do. There are some exceptions, like you don't have to honor your parents if they tell you to break a law, let's say. Oh, so it would be more, that's, that's kind of true practically. I'm with you. But it's more... Um, the greatest way you can honor your parents is by not sacrificing their greatest investment, which is you. So don't throw your life away is the greatest way you can honor your parents. You're not exactly when you're not listening to them by, by keeping the Torah. Well, you, you kind of are. But also, again, values are hierarchical. What's the top of that Ten Commandments? God exists. So you, you have to choose one over another. But you still also preserve it is my point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cool. And then when, let's say, you, you, so that, is that why it's so complicated when it comes to like killing a baby or a mother to save the child or the, like killing one yeah. person to save someone else? Yeah, that's, that, that's a mess of halachas, yeah. That's complicated stuff. But yeah, those are, those are balancing value judgments and we, you know, you can get into that. Those are interesting topics. And how do they justify that? Like, what, like, how would they make such a thing possible? Yeah, that's... <laughs> like, what hierarchy is that going under? Well, there, 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 there is, a, there is a, a, an obligation to save people's lives. And whenever you see someone who is called a rodaf, that's the conceptualization, you know, someone who's chasing after someone to hurt them, whether they're going to kill them or, you know, physically, you know, sexually abuse them, you stop them, and you can stop them to the extent of killing them in those cases. Because it's not that you're murdering, you're saving a life. Right. Again, the complexity of rules, it's not just a bunch of rules in a rule book. Yeah. It's weighing, weighing the meaning uh, within life itself. That's hard to do. Can you say that again? That the, again, that this is not about the idea of the Ten Commandments, is that this is not just a rule book, but we're, we're weighing the meaning that's contained in life. That's what moral living is. Okay. So those are the Ten Commandments. Hierarchy of values. 
So what's the Torah and what's what's a mitzvah? These other categories. Well, I mean the the Chumash itself, like I said, is a narrative, and is is the source material that all halacha is derived from. And we we derive, and even it's fair to even say, you know, within certain rules, halacha is created from the text. And it's created by something called, you know, they have these 13 rules of exegesis. The, 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 you have in the Sidur, you know, right after morning brachas, uh, the, 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 the Mishnah of Rabbi Ishmael, and it goes through and gives 13. And, well, those are the rules by which you create halacha. And I, I kind of comparing this to, say, mitzvah, which, which would be the oral aspect of things, not quite Gemara, but, you know, Mishma is the drawing out of each particular commandment from the text. Well, there's, it's a press because, you know, anytime that you, anytime that you standardize a text, you guys ever read, like, books that were written 200 years ago? Gulliver's, yeah. Gulliver's Travels, you know, for example? Oh, man. Well, Gull I mean, Gulliver's Travels, like, in Eng that's written in English. And I read that to my, my daughter, she was five, and it was like, after one page, I realized this is a bad idea, because it's such high English. And the words in English that are being used don't have the same meaning as they do today. So what I basically ended up doing was like, I'm skimming ahead as I'm talking, and I'm just like translating into modern English the story. I mean, she, I mean, she was five, she still remembers it. Really great stories. Gull Gulliver's Travels, check out the book. But as soon as you, as soon as you write down anything, well, it's frozen in time. So there's a really there's a really uh, huge disincentive to the extent that I said earlier it's actually forbidden, and it's forbidden for this very reason. That it wasn't until Rabbi Yehuda and Nasi, you know, during the times of the Roman conquest, that uh, the way that different Rishonim and Gaonim describe it is that just you know it, there was such a societal upheaval during that time that students couldn't properly learn from their teachers. And so seeing this problem, seeing Judaism threatened, its very existence hanging on the line, well, Rabbi Yehud Hanasi had to pull an Eliyahu Anavi trick, Horasha. It's time to break the Torah to save the Torah. So even though we're taking a hit, in terms of language and culture also. I mean, the Mishnah was written in a, in a, in a very less technologically sophisticated culture than ours. I mean, you know, it, ta it takes a couple days to figure out, you know, they had these like, you know, well mechanisms that you're, you're learning about, you know, how exactly how these could, you know, using such a thing could be a problem on Shabbos. Well, you have to have a whole research project just to figure out what are they describing with this sort of thing? You know, as opposed to, well, you just knew it because it's an oral tradition that you never wrote down, and so it's, it's at your fingertips. You also lose that. You have to translate an ancient culture into modern times. It's another reason why it was forbidden to write this down. There's, there's also like this, um, maybe like a psychological perspective on this, where you say you look at, you look at the written Torah, as almost like society itself. You know, society is basically, you know, ordered uh, structures that benefit us, you know, like, you know, the roads work, the lights work, you know, and there are certain beliefs within every society, um, and they do change, but they change because the younger generation has to uh, basically save this dead society, so to speak, and, and reinvent it for modern times. So, I mean, like, I grew up with cassettes. They just don't exist anymore. You know, it's, it's a life experience that just doesn't, doesn't exist. It's not there anymore. And that's just a small example. Well, <laughs> culture is, is a load of those sorts of things. And what the younger generation has to do is look at their culture, gain the wisdom that they can take from it, and translate it into modern times, translate it into the life they're living. Well, as soon as you write down the oral text, which was, that was kind of the younger generation, so to speak. That's what it represented. Trying to make, to, it enabled renewing Jewish society and Jewish morality every generation. 
Well, now that stopped because it was put down in a text. Another reason why it was forbidden. But despite all of that, Yehuda Hanasi did it anyway. And that's the situation we all live in today. And I mean, this one's even more complicated because, you know, this, the, the oral text, again, is, is always centering around trying to take all this nice laundry list of rules and make them applicable in your personal situation at this particular time with this particular group of people. There's so many factors that it just would have been way more efficient if we could have just kept that one organic. And that goes a long way and also kind of seeing, well, wait a second, well, when we say the Torah is infinite, well, what do we mean by that? You, know, you have so many factors you have to always consider whenever making a moral choice. Well, it might as well be infinite. I mean, there's no human mind that could anywhere near come close to taking all the factors you need to, to make a 100% a, you know, a full-blown choice. So there's a lot of almost like a part of the divinity of it, you know, the, the fact that, that God went to the trouble of creating a hierarchy and helping. It's almost like, you know, God, you know, did the work for us. You know, if, if we would live, you know, infinitely long and had the advantage of being able to see everything, well, we'd also order uh, the uh, moral principles the same way. But since we're limited, we kind of have to trust God for that one. He simplified the work. So that's... That's the Mishnah. Sher Ketavti. Again, this is referring to Navi. What's Navi? What are you supposed to get out of Navi? It's definitely not Halacha, that's for sure. The Rambam Paskins, that if there were, you know, say we had a, a prophet come and come along, and, you know, he's a good prophet, you know, he's not a bad guy, you know, he believes in God and everything, and he says he had a prophecy that God told him there's such and such a halacha that needs to be created. Well, he would have the category of being what's called a Navi Sheker, a, a, a lying prophet, lack of a better term, and he would be chai of Misa. Did a Navi tell us this thing? Moshe did. <laughs> Is that kind of like a Navi told us that? That's important. That's important distinction. Moshe Rabbeinu, well, what made Moshe Rabbeinu unique? Because he's the one that gave so us the chumash. Mm, yeah. yeah. It's like we only call him a prophet because we lack a better term for it. He's not a prophet. In fact, this is one of the 13 principles of faith that the Rambam outlines. Is you have, it's, it's, man, if you want a chalak and olam haba, you got to know, God is not a prophet. He's a prophet plus. He is entirely unique from all other prophets that ever came after him. He's the spitz. You know, like that, Moshe is it. Um, so, and, you know, that's, that's, that's one reason why we don't have a evolving theology like Christianity or Islam. We say the buck stops with Moshe. It says in Devarim, there will never arise a greater prophet than Moshe. He's it. And so he, he you know, with other Navis, you know, what, what goes on, the process is, you know, it's usually at night, and, they, you know, it looks like they're having a seizure, and it's a very out-of-body experience sort of thing, and, but... It, dependent upon how developed of an individual they are, it's almost like looking through clouded glass. The image they receive is being translated through who they are. And Moshe Rabbeinu was the most refined person who had ever lived, to the point where in his waking life, God just talked to him. In fact, all other, all other prophets, God calls you. You never call God. Moshe Rabbeinu could call God. So he's not a Navi. Just the lack of a better term, we call him a Navi. So, so if that's the case, what exactly is, is, is all these books in Navim and Ksuvim, well, what are they all about? What they're entirely concerned with, Rav Harish, I think he speaks this out best, is they're all describing and struggling with the, the moral character of the society. It's not necessarily rules as such, but it's it's more about it's more about how to live with mistakes and come back from them. And keeping ever present in mind 
that despite the fact we live in an imperfect world, and it would be so easy to give up, to succumb to nihilism and say nothing matters, that we have to constantly raise our gaze upward to transcend our being, to be bigger than what we are, to be brave enough to do that. And by doing so, life actually gets better. Kind of an offshoot, this, also, this, you know, this is also a repeating theme in Navi, is this balance between having you know, beneficial societies, you know, the, the kingship, and there's rule and order. Like, societies function. I mean, like, that's, that's how, how do rules play out? Well, you have, to have a, you have to have a system of doing that. Well, the, the balance in Navi is, is the retelling of the same history over and over is that, well, you need hierarchies, you need structure, you need, you need that sort of order so society can function and function well and improve everyone's life. But they get top-heavy. And the Navi was, was almost like the, 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 the moral conscience of the Jewish people constantly defying the Jewish king, who was evil. You better get back, get back in line, buddy, because guess what? You're going, somewhere, you're going somewhere that you don't realize and you do really don't want to go. That's, the, that's, the, that's, the basic, that's another example of the basic structure of Navi. You see that, you know, Shmuel, you know, was hesitant to, to create a king. And, you know, even there, you know, it, it, we had, you know, the way that Jewish society was functioning. You had judges and you know, the tr different tribes. And what they, what they more or less functioned as was like a, a check and balance, kind of like the, kind of like the American system of government. You had every single tribe and, and every single judge, every single Jewish uh, court, keeping every other one in check. If you look in Devarim, Tesvav Yud Aleph, the funny Pusik, goes along these sort of lines. It says in Devarim that poverty will always exist. And you have an obligation to give charity. In the Gemara, Gemara Shabbos, Shmuel goes one step further and he says, you know what, it's not only true that poverty will always exist, there will always be top-heavy hierarchies that there's always going to be people on the bottom. But that's even going to be the case in the times of Mashiach. Yeah, You'll always have poor people. But isn't everyone going to be happy on Saturday? Sure they will. So even the poor people well, are going to be happy, happy sleeping on the streets? They won't be sleeping on the streets. They'll just be poorer than the people above them. So basically it won't be a communist. communist. No, yeah, definitely not. We don't get communism. Communism is that that we don't want. The They're like it can't be too poor. The the Hemeka Davar, in his commentary on Devarim, there he 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 describes that that well this you know poverty but not just poverty but like hierarchies are built into reality. You always have a pecking order, and. What's really cool about that is when we turn to our, our friends, the scientists and researchers, this is called Price's Law. Basically, the way Price's Law works, it, 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 the guy's name was Derek, Derek Price. He lived in the 60s, and he noticed something really odd about, about uh, professors and research papers. He, he, he just on the cuff realized, well, it's usually the same people writing the same research papers. What's going on? So he actually figured out an equation that could predict who's writing the research papers at what frequency? And it's something to the effect of the square root of half. So if you had, say, 100 papers are being written, you have 100 research papers being written, well, and there, you have 25 authors total, five of them are going to write half of those research papers. Now what we notice since Price is that the entire universe functions on this equation. The mass of stars or the mass of galaxies work this way. The, the density of trees and forests works this way. Uh, the, the, a businesses work this way. If you're a business owner, it's really important to know that if, if I'm sorry, if you have 25 employees, sorry, that five of them are doing half the work. So that's really important to know. And that's, that's one reason why when, when a business is struggling, they go into death throes because what happens is the people are doing half the work, see where this one's going, and they get new jobs. 
And so it's not just the business starts struggling, but then the people doing half the work just left. And that's how your business just dies. So this works on every is level. Only five people. Or yeah, if you had, if you had twenty-five workers in your a employment. Fifth of the people. So five of those guys are doing fifty percent of the work. If you had fifty people, then ten people. It, 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 that's it's the, the square root of half. So whatever that always works out to. So it's I mean it's it's it, where's a pen whatever uh, here we go. So it's it's an L graph. It's an L graph. It's exactly what that looks like. Exactly. What I'm driving at, that the, the, the story of Navi is all about this reality, that you need hierarchies. They do exist. They're built into reality. Is that also, could that also be the proportion of people who are keeping the actual terror? Like, I was just going to say, there's a Pirkei Avos on this that describes how infrequent it is you run across a Talmud Chacham. <laughs> Goes according to Price's Law. Goes according to Price's Law. You can't escape hierarchies, but you always have to fight to make sure they don't become corrupt. We have to face this aspect of reality, accept that it's true. There's nothing we can do about it. We can't, we can't get rid of poverty, let's say, uh, entirely, but we can artificially do things to make it a lot easier on people. Would the nubbies be the ones, would they be the, like, the five people out of the 25? Like the Navi. Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Even the word usage you use, 90% of the words you use are in a group of four, 500 words. You know, it's like those 500 words are what you use 90% of the time. Like this is just this is just built in across reality. So the Hamak Adavar, man, was he correct about this one. And this is the story of Navi. But when the hierarchy is working well, when the, when the king listens to the Navi, we have another graph to look at. The same graph, when, when, when we are investing and, you, and leveraging everybody's skills and leveraging everybody's talents, let's call it capitalism, all of a sudden, the wealth in the world skyrockets. Life gets better. Kind of like you were saying, are people going to live on the street? Definitely not. Because when you harness a, harness a hierarchy, when you don't allow it to become tyrannical, a lot's riding on this. This improves life dramatically. This makes life better for everybody. So even though you still have people comparatively who are poorer, man, it's not living on the street. And that's what you get. Through, and even kind of going back a few stages, looking at the the... The, the, the Ten Commandments, again, there is hierarchy. There's levels of importance. This is the way reality is. And so, it's complicated to navigate it. But we have a system that enables us to do that. And I think it's even more funny. Again, Price's Law, you take all the religions in the world. This one's kind of a joke, but I think it's true. Take all the religions in the world. Wait a second. The, the difficulty everybody has, oh, the Jewish people, you guys think that you have the truth? I don't know, but Price's Law kind of tells me maybe I do. I might. Price's Law, good indication. It's not a proof, but it would fit the pattern. Um, so I was asking about, so what you were saying about the poverty not being as bad, can you explain that point again, how that works? Will there be more... Will the hierarchy be a bigger group of people? Or it's gonna be, oh, I well, know. I mean, looking at... I, I, cause I th I thought it was kind of calf. You can pass this around. That's poverty rate for the world. There's way less poverty. I think. I think the the United Nations. Uh, the way you measure poverty nowadays is it's basically like, you know whoever's making a, a below a dollar fifty is an abstract poverty, and they're going to they're going to eliminate abstract poverty in like five years. There will be no poverty in the world. What's the difference between percentage of world population and number of people? Just two different ways of measuring them because because you have you can take the whole population at any given time, but you're also kind of factoring in the the proportionality that world would be. population went down that much. No, no poverty based on world population oh, went down that oh. much, which is also an L-shaped graph. It's just Price's law flipped, meaning that yes, that that as the Navi the Navi warns is that well you know 
things can become tyrannical and you know power can can become so overwhelming in the hands of the few and so you have to you don't give up the hierarchy because that's built into the system you don't try and become a communist or anything like that but what you do is you recognize that there's a there's a moral duty as the king to make sure that that sort of corruption doesn't happen there has to be someone standing above the king and this is kind of the point i wanted to kind of tie it all together is that as the Navi reminds the king, there is someone above you. There is a, a, a hierarchy of rules. There is such a thing as the Ten Commandments. And the very first commandment on that list is there is a God. So it's true, you might be very, very powerful, but you stand before someone. You're not the top of the hierarchy. I think so. We'll kind of we'll kind of leave it there, and the next week we'll 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 dive into what Gamar is, and sort out the question: What did Moshe really really know? Did he have it all, or just a little bit, or kind of get that one more clear? Well, but any, like the only question he had to ask was why good things happen to bad people. If he had a lot more to know, he would have asked other questions. Well, a lot of good things happen to people, and they keep getting better. They do on every ma- on every matrix. I mean, like it's so crazy. Like in terms of death rates, disease, you know, starvation, war. I mean, like there are fewer wars and less people die in those wars. I mean, like the world is just getting better and better and better. And it's not just even just getting a little better. It's like the rate at which it gets better becomes more quick. Do you think the world now is getting better? Yeah, on every measure. If you go back 200 years, 300 years, I mean, you can't always all the time. I mean, that's, that's a long, long period of time. But oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Crime rates plummeting. You know, safety. I mean, like, man, like, the, the, o- the only, the, and I thought that's, this was funny, is like every accidental death is reducing. Even the chances of getting hit by lightning are, are shrinking with every given day. Like, yeah, life's getting better, man. Someone was saying about the crime rates going down, that people are just so busy on their phones. Like, you're no longer scared to walk past, like, like it used to be before people were so busy on their phones that, like, you were scared to walk past dangerous looking people because yeah. they're like, yeah. might come and attack you. But now people are busy more with, like, cyber hacking and things like that. No, even so that's, but, it's a new problem, but even there it's being solved. And even those. Those problems are being reduced, and it's it's. And I guess like that's kind of it's kind of a funny place we ended in, but like that. But that's the the story of Navi, is well, you need to have hierarchy and order and, and governmental structures and and people who know what they need to do and leverage people's skills in order to make life better. But just be careful when you do it, because it could turn tyrannical. And hurt the North Korea. That's a tyrannical oh. government. You know, it's like the, the only the only places that actually suffer famine today are places where the government is actually choosing to make it that way. You know, like India? Oh, yeah. It's like, I mean, famine is like almost a thing of the past. I mean, like a couple of years ago, there are more obese people living today than people suffering from famine. Oh, wow. That's a bigger problem. A couple of years ago, it just flipped. Mm. The world's getting better. No, oh, is it bad? I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> like most teachers just... No. Yeah. There's, there's, there's not. Family. You can give them food. All right, guys. Any questions? Thoughts? Is that interesting? Yes. Okay. Yes.